Good morning everyone, I hope you're all well. It has not felt like a vlogging week, I don't know why. Some weeks it just feels, because I only really work like four days and I don't make content on weekends, sometimes I just feel like I don't have enough days or enough interesting things to vlog. So I thought this week I would do an old school Q&A video because I haven't done one in a while and I actually really like them because it feels like a chance for me to connect with you guys, it feels like a little, little bit of a two-way conversation and we could just like take a minute and catch up. I've screenshot some questions that I took from Instagram. My stomach is rumbling so let's see how many we can get through before I have to stop and have some lunch. 26 questions. Are we gonna be able to get through 26 questions? I've printed them off like a true millennial. Let's start with something easy. You're going to M&S to get a sweet and a savory treat. What are you getting? Okay, first thing that comes to mind, savory. They've got these, you know, in like the, the snack section, like the to-go with the sandwiches. They've got where you have the cucumber and hummus. They have these like pizza snacks. It's almost like a crusty bread, like a crouton. And then they've got this kind of pizza, tomato-y, cheesy dip. And it's a really great savory snack and it's crunchy and it's savory and it's delicious. For a sweet treat, it would either be like a yum yum, but that would be like a, a mega treat. I don't often allow myself to eat yum yum, but they are just like a classic. It's basically a donut, but they're the best. I used to have them when it was my birthday after school. But more recently I have tried the dark chocolate covered sour cherries and they are delicious. I tried the mango, it wasn't that fussed, but the sour cherries covered in dark chocolate are just like really, really yummy. They're chewy and they're kind of sweet and sour. Delish. What is the thing you appreciate most about Rich. I added this one in because today, whilst I'm filming this, it is our eight year wedding anniversary. Can you believe it? For those of you that have been here for a while, eight years since we got married. How crazy. We've actually been together for 17 years, which sounds insane. I've just posted a video on Instagram sharing some snippets from our honeymoon video, which I don't think I ever put online. It was just for us, but I kind of filmed it vlog style because it was, it must have been like 2017 or something. So it was like prime vlogging time. And I don't think I knew then how to film without it feeling like a vlog. So I basically vlogged our honeymoon, but then never put it anywhere because it was just for us. So I've shared some snippets on Instagram, which is kind of cute. We look like babies. I think what I appreciate most about Rich um, is number one, his just his kindness. He's like a genuinely kind person, but he has, he hasn't got like major insecurities and he hasn't got a big ego. And I do think that that can often be a really tricky thing with men. So I I love that about him and I think it makes our relationship just a lot easier. Neither of us have a big ego or huge insecurities, although I'm sure some of you would disagree about that when I say that about myself, but, but it's true. Like, I'm not talking like minor insecurities, like my hair, my face or whatever, things like that, but like deep insecurities because it, it being quite like a self-confident, secure person makes relationships a lot easier, I think, and and not having a big ego. And what I mean by that is he doesn't he doesn't think his job is more important than mine, or he doesn't think his social life is more important than mine, or his free time, or we just don't have that dynamic. And I I just it I really love that about him, and it makes everything so much easier. We really split and share the load when it comes to life and everything. And I know that's not the case for everyone. He doesn't just assume because he's the man that his job is more important than mine or because he's the man, he doesn't have to do certain jobs around the house. Like there just isn't any of that. He's also just not too stubborn. Like he can be stubborn about things. He never wants to like go to a social event when I'm saying like, we go to this thing. He's like, I don't wanna go, but then he will come. If it means, if it's important to me, if it's like a family thing that he doesn't wanna go to, he will come for me and then he'll love it. and. He's, he's open-minded. He's not like, no, I'm not doing that. He's just chilled. He is a wonderful husband and I'm not gonna say I'm lucky to have him. I'm grateful to have him as my husband. What was your birth experience like for Grey and Rudy? So I'm gonna do a like super quick roundup for anyone who is new here. I was a week or a little bit more than a week overdue with Grey, got all the way to 10 centimeters, pushed for two and a half hours and she was stuck. She was back to back and she just wasn't coming out even though they thought she was when, when I went into theater and they were gonna try forceps 
she was actually further up than they realised and I had to have an emergency C-section. Recovery was brutal because I'd laboured and pushed for so long. So I had to recover from labour and, you know, my face was hurting from them, clenching from the pushing, but then also recovering from an emergency C-section, which luckily wasn't like an emergency, like red light, nothing, none of that. She was fine. Her heart rate didn't drop or anything. It was just an emergency because it wasn't planned. With Rudy, I decided to have an elective C-section. I went to see a women's like physio type thing where they like check you internally. And I discovered, which by the way, I think if you are thinking of having children, um, go and do like one of these mummy MOTs. Even if you're not a mum yet, go to a women's physio where they check you internally. I just think it's really good and important to learn about your body. I discovered in my session that I have a very tight pelvic floor. I always thought I had total opposite. And from learning that, I could then make a decision about the birth I wanted with Rudy. And I decided that I didn't want to risk him getting stuck again. So although I think I labored quite well with Gray and I feel like I could have done it, I just decided I didn't want to risk it. And I had an elective C-section and it was really lovely and really calm. And the recovery was really easy because I think it's, it's quite different when you have an elective to an emergency. But also Rich got COVID after I had gave birth to Rudy and had to isolate and none of my family were allowed to come over. So I had a one week old newborn and a two and a half year old on my own after having a C-section, like any other operation. And you would just like, not be expected to do anything. But I, I remember just crying so much on like FaceTime to my friends and family being like, I don't know how to even lift Grey out of her cot. I can't lift. I've just had a major surgery. I've got a newborn, like it was hell. But other than that, the recovery was great. <laughs> it actually sped up the recovery because I was so preoccupied looking after the kids. I just like forgot to take any of my pain meds and I just had to get on with it. It was, it was brutal. The next question which I get asked a lot is are you planning on having any more children? And before I answer this, I am so, so grateful and so lucky to even be in the position to consider it. So many of my friends are struggling having kids for all different kinds of reasons and I'm totally aware that it's a very sensitive subject and it always feels icky have, talking about like, oh, do I want another? Do I not? When I know that that's just not even a choice for some people. I am jealous of my friends who who know, like they either, they're like two and done and they're like, yep, yeah, locked up, <laughs> zipped up, what's it called? I don't know, sold all the baby stuff, I'm done. Or I have friends who are like, no, I definitely wanna try for a third. And like, that's, they they know. My problem in life is I'm, I'm always very indecisive about these things. And this is just another one of those things. I come from a family of three. Rich also is one of three. He's the, he's the eldest of three, I'm the youngest of three. So it's kind of all we know. When I tell you this like, consumes my brain all the time. I spent our entire summer holiday writing pros and cons lists and just feeling quite stressed about it. It's really sad, I just wish I knew. I'm too much of a planner, I'm too much of an overthinker. I can't just go into things spontaneously without feeling like I've thought it through. I know there are many things in life you can't plan for, but as much as I can, I like to plan. And there's just so many pros and cons. Like my list is hilarious. I've read it to friends and they think I'm crazy. I just really want my kids to be surrounded by lots of family. I can really imagine myself with three grown up children. I really can. I just can't imagine having three young children. And I just don't think I could go back to being pregnant again and doing the newborn thing. I'm not that good at it. I'm good at this stage. Like now my kids are how old is he? Like almost three and five. I feel like I am thriving as a mum. I feel like we're now getting our life back a bit. It feels so much easier now and I'm really scared of going back to that. And it's really hard with work. I don't get mat leave or anything like that. The answer is, I don't know, but my biggest worry is I don't wanna look back and think I really wish I had gone for a third. I'm so nervous of feeling that regret. Like, I don't think anyone ever regrets having a third, but they do regret not having a third. Actually, maybe, maybe people do. No one ever talks about it. Let me know. I said to my mum, I was like, mum, pretend it's not me. Pretend I wasn't your third and I promise I will not be offended. But do you feel like life would have been easier if you hadn't have had three? Do you kind of regret it in any way? And she was like, absolutely not. I was like, oh, let me know if you regret it. <laughs> well, this is an interesting one because I've never really spoken about this, but there's no reason not to. Someone asked, why did you leave Gleam 
um, Gleam was my previous agency. I loved Gleam. I was with Gleam for like over 10 years. I was probably like the fifth or sixth person to join. I think I joined before Zoe joined Gleam and I really like grew with the agency. Like we were really part of something special of like creating and forming and nurturing this this new exciting industry. We would do panels all the time. And I literally remember the day that we created briefs as part of a job process because there, there never used to be briefs. It was really, really, truly special. Towards the end of my time at Gleam, the company got sold to a bigger company. And at first, you know, there was no worry. It, there weren't gonna be any initial changes, but with anything, when a company gets sold to a bigger company, gradually things will start to change a bit. And I think the biggest change for me was that the senior leadership team started to leave. And those are the people I had really close relationships with. So that was okay at first when, you know, bigger people started to leave from the top. But if I'm honest, I think where Gleam kind of went wrong is that instead of hiring externally, they, they just did a lot of promoting up within the company. And for me, it just got to the point where there weren't enough people there who knew more about things, who knew more about the industry than I did. I felt like I had more experience than the people who I was working with. And I think it's really important to always be working with people that you can learn from. And that's not necessarily always just an age thing, although I, I do think it became quite a young company. I think I just felt like it was my time and it was scary. It was the one thing I would had always been terrified of because it was such a close nurtured relationship, but it felt like the right time. So I moved to an agency called YMU and the team there is head up, headed up by my friend, Lucy Loveridge, who's incredible and who had been with me at Gleam. So I really trusted her. So although it was scary, it wasn't as scary. It's a much more of a business relationship. And I think that's probably how it should be and how it is for most agencies. But Gleam just had, because of how it started, it was a very personal, like close knit, like family. It felt like a family. So it was a lot of change and a lot to get used to, but it was the right time for me. And I have mad respect for my manager who I was with towards the end of my time at Gleam because I had a six month probation period, which is kind of brutal. And at first I was just so worried that I was gonna spend those six months just with no work and feeling totally isolated, but she was totally professional and she still went out and got me jobs and she still cared and gave me her time and attention. And she just made the process a lot easier. It could have been really, really painful. So I majorly appreciate that. How do you feel about approaching 40? Am, am I, I'm not approaching 40. I'm gonna be 37 in December. That's not approaching 40. I feel like when you're 39, you're approaching 40. I'm not worried about it. I really feel like age is just a number. I feel quite young these days. Like I feel more secure in myself and more confident. I'm just excited. I actually think for, like your 40s look quite fun. Like your kids are a little bit older. You get a bit more of your freedom back and everyone has a party. Not worried about it, but I, it does blow my mind though to think that I'll be 40 in the next few years. Like if you ask me how old are you, the first thing my brain thinks is like 28. I don't really feel like an adult. Has laser hair removal worked? and is it worth it? I have a similar skin tone and hair color. Let me see, I haven't shaved my legs in ages. Let's have a look at them. There's some, there, there are some little hairs there, but definitely nothing. I wouldn't feel comfortable just like putting a skirt on. I love that, I love that my legs are just like prepped. I had a uh, laser hair removal at New You in Primrose Hill and I'd had previous laser hair removal at another place and it was the painful one where it's like, it's like a staple gun. It's like, chick, chick, and it hurts so much. And that one didn't work for me, weirdly. The hair just came back. Whereas this one, which is pain-free, has worked. I don't understand the theory there. You would have thought that the pain-free one like wouldn't be as strong, but it's not the case at all. It's worked really well on me. Like full disclosure, I didn't pay for it. It was a gift of service. And, and Sam from New You has been like overwhelmed and so happy with how much my coverage of her treatment has a new business for her and she's been really really kind and gifted me the treatment. I do think if I was paying for it I maybe would have been surprised at the amount of top-ups I needed to have. I don't know so I guess sometimes you'd hope that it's like six sessions and done but I do think you need to have those top-ups to kind of keep it going. But definitely once you've had the like bulk of your sessions you start to see the hair thin out and depending on the area you don't always have to 
top it up. I did a little bit on my arms and it's like, I don't mind having some hair on my arms. So I haven't had, to, I don't need to top that up. I just did like a few sessions. My face as well, but that's more hormonal. So I will kind of top that up sometimes. It makes a difference just from that first session and makes hair much more like manageable. I'm super impressed. Any chance you can do something on kids clothes, your kids style looks so cool. Thank you very much. Please be aware that during the week my kids wear disgusting clothes. <laughs> That's when all the Paw Patrol t-shirts come out and the like random leggings from god knows where and like it's just they do not look like styled chic kids all the time, I promise. They barely have any like nice clothes. We just like rotate the nice ones on weekends. But actually I put up a photo last week and everyone was like, I love Grey's jeans. Those were just from Tesco. Uh, Tesco, H&M, Zara. For boys clothes, I really like Next. It's really hard, I think, to find good boys like trousers. They all have tight ankles. It just doesn't suit Rit Rich. It just doesn't suit Rudy. He is like Rich. He's got like a bigger bum and thighs and like wearing like tapered trousers just doesn't look good on him. But it's really hard to find boys trousers that are like loose at the bottom. Next do some really good sets. Like they're out of stock at the moment, but they're really cool like loose stripy trousers. And they're soft as well, so they're comfortable. I don't like putting like two year olds in jeans and uncomfortable clothes. So they're like soft trousers and it comes with a hoodie. So we just got like three of those and that's like three hoodies and three trousers and we'll rotate those and they're really great. So yeah, I would say next is really good for boys and then for gray, like, yeah, I'll do like Tesco or H&M or Zara if I want something really nice. Would Rich ever consider quitting his job and starting to work with you? No, we have never considered it. And it's been hard because a lot of people who do my job their husbands work for them. And with that, you get a huge amount of flexibility. It means you don't have to pay for a photographer or videographer because you're, you've are you got one in-house. It means that there's kind of, in a way, less pressure on spending time together because you can spend time together whilst working. You can go on trips together, you can go do shoot content and then you're together and you can have lunch together. And like, there's so many benefits of it. Sometimes I look and think like, wow, that is so amazing. But then I also think there's a lot of negatives towards it as well. First of all, it just was never an option for us because Rich is not a creative person. He would not be able to take my photos or do my videos or edit or anything like that. So it was never an option for that reason. But I also think that even if he could, I'm not sure we would because I think it's really important in a relationship to have your own careers, to have your own thing. I love that about us. He's currently working downstairs. I'm working upstairs. We're doing our own thing. And I think it's very healthy. I don't know if I would feel comfortable with him. It being all about me and him having to work for me and do what I want and I don't think it would be healthy for him. And on a similar topic, someone said, my partner's thinking of a career change. Any tips from Rich? As some of you might know, Rich took a break from his job. It kind of coincided, it was good timing. I had Rudy, I didn't feel like I could take mat leave. I took three months off with Grey and then I went back to work only two days a week and it was a really, really tricky like two years. So this time he wanted to do it differently. And so Rich got really good paternity leave. So he did like nine months paternity leave. And then he decided to actually leave his job because he wasn't loving it anyway. I think often after uni, you can kind of fall into a job and you're so young at that point, like you don't really know what you want to do. And then you kind of just find yourself in this career and you think like, is this actually what I want to be doing? He decided to leave his job. And then when Rudy started nursery, Rich used that time to go to uni. He did like a university course. He did a Cambridge University course and he retrained into something else that he was interested in. He actually saw a life coach first, which helped him get to that point of working out what he wanted to do. And during that time, it was quite tricky. I felt quite pressured being like the only one working, especially having like a young baby. But it was tricky and Rich had his health anxiety at the same time, which you will know about if you heard us talking on Giovanna Fletcher's podcast about it. It was a tricky time, but it was still amazing that he was able to take that time and rethink things and think, right, what do I want to go into? He managed to find a job quite quickly, which was amazing, but he's had to go in at a lower level, a lower pay. It's weird because he has people above him who are younger than him. I always say it's a bit like Chandler from Friends when he gets the advertising job and everyone's like super young. It is strange at first, but that's what you gotta do when you, you wanna get into a new career that you have no experience in and work your way up. And hopefully long-term that will pay off for him. So it's really exciting. I think, yeah, his advice is if you are feeling unhappy, like now is the time, don't wait, don't regret it. There's never gonna be a better time to the 
give it a go if you are able to. He's really happy that he did. How do you picture your life in 10 years time? So this is a question I used to find really hard to answer. And I used to just kind of brush it off and say like, oh, 10 years ago, I had no idea I'd be here. So who knows what's gonna happen? But actually when I did spot start speaking to a life coach, that was one of the first things we did. She asked me to make a kind of mood board or drawings or whatever I wanted that would show where my life would be in five years time. And I found it so hard at first, but then, then I found it really easy and I found it so interesting. I would show you, but it's quite personal. My biggest learning from that exercise was I, I came away just feeling so grateful for what I've got because I realized that what I want in five, 10 years time is very similar to what I've got now. And how incredible is that? Like, I just feel so lucky that that's the case. I think that really quite kind of like blew my mind. Yes, there were like a few changes in where we live and how our kind of home looks, but I had some like pictures that represented our lifestyle and our home and holidays and food markets and London living. And I had some kind of work pictures that represented stuff I do now, shoot days with Georgia, like feeling creative, having that kind of flexible work life balance, but then also had like new pictures of working in a team in a creative space. And I would love in like 10 years time to be working like two days a week or something with a team, doing something else, just feeling creative and working with other people. Cause I really do enjoy doing that. And whether that's like consulting for brands or working on like projects, or I don't know exactly what that thing is. And it is frustrating sometimes that I feel like I can't get to that point quicker than I, I would like to, but just knowing, visualizing that big round table, of lots of people in a big creative bright room with pictures on the wall, like that is exciting for me. Like I definitely wanna incorporate some of that into my life. But other than that, not much was different. And I feel incredibly lucky and grateful that that's the case. Is your dream forever home? So this is like a similar topic. Is your dream forever home similar to your current one, bigger or a lot different? I think a lot of people find it quite confusing when I say that this isn't our forever home and that we'll have to move. And it's so different depending on where you live in the UK or if you live in other countries, it's really hard to explain. Everyone kind of lives in their own bubbles. And for us, it, the reason we'll have to move mainly is a school thing. It's like, it's really stressful in London. The catchments to the schools are really small. So that's the main reason for moving. We could totally stay in this lovely house. Um, so that would be the main thing. What even is a forever home? I'm gonna scrap that saying. That doesn't even make sense. Our next home, we'll probably only live in it until our kids are like in their late twenties and then we'll move again and downsize. Main priority is location for schools, but the problem is when you're buying in a good location with a good school, the house prices are insane. Like it would shock you to your core if you don't live in like a big city to hear the prices of some of these properties for what they are and what you could get elsewhere. I don't necessarily want bigger. I think just the layout would be different like bearing in mind that if the next house is more for like teenagers, it would be great to have uh, another kind of living room, lounge area, snug or some kind of other space so that they could watch their own TV or do their own games or something. A semi-detached would be the dream so we could get bikes in and out. We're currently in like a terrace house. But other than that, like not that much different really. But there's always sacrifices and give and take. Like you can't get your semi-detached with a driveway. There's too many boxes to tick. Like there's always gonna be a compromise. Rich is always talking about it. He's always looking on right move. And I just keep having to tell him to stop because it makes me anxious. I don't wanna always be living in the future. Like, can we just enjoy what we've built, what we've created for the next few years. That's our biggest argument at the moment. What's on your For You page? I love this. Everyone, if you don't use TikTok, there is a, your following list, the people you follow, and then this For You page, which is the algorithm serving you content that they think you want to watch. One of my favorite things to do is when I'm with someone to look on their TikTok and see what's on their For You page, because it's so random and it's so different for everyone. At the moment, I keep getting served people doing the dance routine for the perfect couple intro. If you've watched the perfect couple, they do like this hilarious dance routine and I keep getting served content about that. That is, that is all I'm getting at the moment. I think I need to take a break. I've been talking a lot. I think I need some lunch. I'm gonna stretch my legs. 
and then we can come back for part two. Does this just offend all of your eyes? It's shepherd's pie with baked beans and ketchup all over it. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Super quick lunch break. Leftover dinner from last night. Don't judge me with the ketchup on the shepherd's pie thing. Actually, it's cottage pie. It really just like elevates the whole thing. I think next time I'm actually gonna put some ketchup in when I cook it. Did you decide what you're doing decoration wise with the stairs going up to the loft? Every time I film around the loft kind of stairs area, area it seems to really upset people that we haven't like finished off the stairs to the loft. It's just so annoying. It's one of those things like, I thought I was gonna paint them, but I realized that painted steps, especially when they're steep steps, are so slippery. It's so dangerous. I literally know someone that's having a back operation right now because they fell down some painted stairs. So I'm not gonna paint them. And then I was like, okay, so maybe I'll like sand them down. But one, it's just such a big, like dusty job and like we have to like rent a sander and it's, then, it's not even like nice wood. It's like pine, it's got quite a lot of knots in it. Like, I don't even know if we want to have it wood. So then like the other option, which is pretty cheap is just to like carpet the stairs, but then we'll never match the same carpet as we have on the landing. So it's gonna look different. And then, so do I not try and match it? Do I just go something totally different? And then I'm like, is that a bit weird to have different carpet on the stairs and then I go round and round and then I just give up because it's so like not an exciting thing it's not like I'm redecorating a bedroom or like doing a fun part of a renovation I reckon we'll leave it until we sell the house in years to come and then we'll just like paint them in what ways are your kids similar and how do they differ hmm interesting I feel like my kids are quite stereotypical girl boy first child, second child. They fit into a lot of the stereotypes when it comes to that. In terms of like how they play, Grey is definitely more into like imaginative, like role play. She's not that into toys. She'd rather sit and play mummies and babies for hours. And Rudy does play that with her, which is really sweet. He is able to do that. He's more into like toys, cars, trucks, things. They're both very good when it comes to like hand-eye coordination and being like physically capable. I always feel very safe when they're in the playground, when they're climbing things. They're great with like racket sports. Boards. Like, I think they both get that from me and Rick. Rudy is much more likely to say hello to a stranger that says hello to him or talk to someone or say goodbye, give someone a hug. Whereas like Grey is much more reserved and cautious and shy when it comes to that kind of thing. They both are like quite observant of things. The things that they remember or notice, I'm always quite blown away by that. The next question was about like, are your kids foodies like you are so it kind of comes into the same thing gray i think is a foodie like she's not great at trying new foods but the foods that she does like makes me think that she's gonna be a foodie when she's older because she's got a real savory palette she loves like salami olives stronger flavors garlicky things curries she eats quite well she's just not great at trying new things but once she tries it she she likes a stronger flavor and a wider variety of foods whereas rudy he just like has no time for it he's got no time for eating he just doesn't want to do it he's got better things to do how else are they similar or different he, Rudy's way more confident like Grey will always be more shy at first even though she's not really a shy kid she seems shy when you first meet her so if we're in like a party environment and there's like a circle or you know or or we're out in the, in the library and there's kids other kids to play with Rudy has grown Grey's confidence by having Rudy so he will now grab her hand and take her with him he's only two well he's almost three but he'll like initiate playing with other kids or joining in at a party and then she'll follow him, which is really amazing and makes me like glad I've had another child because he's definitely brought out more confidence in her. She's very maternal and will always kind of want to look after him and she loves being like the mummy. Looks wise, I think they look like, they do look like siblings. They've got the same color hair, very similar hair but their faces are quite different. I think Grey looks more like Richard's side of the family and I think Rudy looks more like my side of the family. They've got different color eyes. They definitely have their own faces. They're not like, you know, some siblings like look exactly the same. It's not like that. How are you finding the ever-changing content creation world since you started? I am fascinated by it and I could literally talk about it for hours, I'm not gonna bore you with it. I love talking to other people who are around in the early days and like reminiscing about how it used to be and how things started and it was so exciting. I think COVID just changed everything. COVID and uh, the launch of TikTok changed the industry majorly. I love the challenge of new platforms and new types of creating content and I think I've done quite well at changing with it throughout the years. I try not to focus too much on like numbers and growth i do find it frustrating to see other people kind of overtake me when it comes to numbers 
not because I don't want them to have that, but it's because I'm just forever like working on it. And I have to remind myself that's not a reflection on my content. I think what's more important to me is like nurturing my community, making content you guys enjoy and seeing the, the views on those contents go up. That's more important than like an overall follower. You're gonna get more followers if you're making a different type of content. It's almost like you need to make content that isn't aimed at your audience to grow in followers because you need to be making content for people who don't know you yet in order to gain them as a follower. Whereas I tend to make content which is for you guys, for my audience. So obviously I'm not going to grow in followers if I'm making content for my existing people who already follow me. Do you know what I mean? So I know what I need to do if I want to grow followers, but I don't really want to do that because I like making content that you guys want to watch. I don't want to constantly be making like content that's just feeding into the algorithm. I think it's more important to me to like nurture my existing audience. The industry has changed loads and I do find that exciting, but sometimes obviously I also find it a bit, sometimes I feel like I'm a part of something which is not really what I signed up for in terms of like how, what the industry has become. But then as long as I just stick in my little corner, then it's all good. I feel really lucky to do the job and I still love doing it, which is why I am. How did you get your confidence back post kids? I'm a new mum and I'm struggling with this new me. So hard at first. Honestly, I think the first two years after having Grey, I was just totally overwhelmed with everything and so lost. And there's lots of different factors that came into that. But I think honestly, the main thing is just time, which I know can be really frustrating when you're in it. But for me, it was just a time thing. I think even though it was a lot easier after Rudy, I still think like the two year mark is when you're like, I'm back a little bit. So just knowing that it will pass in time, that's honestly my best advice. There's no like quick hack personally from me. But the next question is um, kind of similar. How do you think your color analysis has helped your confidence also with building your wardrobe? So. I had a colour analysis with the lovely Louise. If you haven't already seen that video, it's on my YouTube channel, you can go have a watch. It was really, really amazing. And I think I was already on the journey of rediscovering myself and feeling a bit more confident when I saw her, but it just added to that and really helped kind of guide me. Mainly just stopped me wasting money on things that I would later regret. Especially like this time of year, going into a shop, everything's very like khaki greens and sludgy browns and I'm, I'm, I'm not making those impulse purchases because I know now like what does suit me. And it's helped me not only figure out like the, the brighter colors that suit me, but working out like maybe it's nicer to pair that with a gray rather than a black. And it's definitely helped me. I don't think it's like the be all and end all. I think if you feel lost, I don't think you should start with a color analysis. I think you should start with some kind of like wardrobe edit, but then moving from that into a colour analysis I think is really helpful. When you're at the point where you, you want to work out what your wardrobe needs and doesn't need, that's when the colour analysis is very good. I actually got an email from Louise yesterday which was so amazing, showing me all the stats of how many of you guys have booked in with her since I shared that video. Any of you who have had an appointment, she has loved meeting you. She's like, Lily, you have the nicest audience. I'm like, I know, I want to see them more. So thank you for that. And she, it's literally just like changed everything for her. She was doing the odd day in London before and now she's like in London three days a week and she's doing a road show and it's just so amazing for a small business so I'm really happy for her. I'm loving wearing my bright winter colours and I'm literally looking over there now at my little rail and I've got so many reds and greens and blues and I love it. Please please help with which trainers to pair with which jean style. It's a minefield. Oh my god I totally agree. I think the whole what shoes to wear thing is so hard. I definitely need to book in with a stylist to work out my bag and shoe wardrobe. I just keep meaning to and haven't had the time and haven't really found like the right person, but that's what I need to do. I just have so many things with shoes that make it hard for me to work out what shoes to wear. But anyway, that's not what the question is. What trainers to wear with what which jeans? It is hard. I've kind of worked it out a bit, I think. Not with like all jean styles, but I can give you like two examples of like the most common jean styles that I wear and I can show you. So I think with a barrel leg jean or a cropped jean, the best trainer to wear would be a chunky trainer. That is what works best for me. I really like the mix of the chunky trainer with a bit of the gap between the jeans and the shoe. If you wear like a bulky heavy trainer with a long loose jean, there's just too much bulkiness at the bottom there. So I think with the chunky trainers, it's best to wear like a barrel leg, a tapered leg, a cropped leg. And then with the kind of more thinner, flatter trainers like an Adidas Samba, 
They're a bit more like lower to the ground, same with like a Converse. I think it's nice with like a full length jean, whether that's like a baggy jean, a wide leg, full length jean, a flared, people wear flares. I think that's for me how I work it out. Just don't ask me about any shoes that aren't trainers because I don't know. How is the Loewe puzzle? I've got it here, let me grab it. This is my Loewe puzzle bag and I am really happy with it. I feel like I haven't worn it in a while because it really isn't a very like summer bag or color, but now we're going into autumn winter. I'm really enjoying wearing it again. It always shows lighter on, well, it always shows lighter on camera than it actually is. It's kind of a darkish gray and I'm happy with the color because it goes with more things than just a black bag, I think. I love the gold hardware. It's a really good size. It's just like a smarter bag. So I find I don't wear it as often. It's not like an everyday bag, but if I'm going into town, if I've got a meeting, if I'm wearing a nice outfit, this uh, works really nicely. And I like, you can wear it top handle or long strap. And yeah, I am really glad I, I got it. When I first got it, I was like, oh God, am I wearing it enough? But I think it's got longevity. How do you manage a social life with kids? I feel so tired and guilty. Who do you feel guilty for? The kids or the friends? Again, it's really hard. Like I find the constant having to like get babysitters and figure out the babysitter thing is, I just feel, I don't want to constantly be asking people to do us favors that like we go out tonight for our, wedding anniversary dinner. So then I wouldn't feel comfortable then getting a babysitter on the weekend. That's like too much in one week. So that's really tricky. I find it really hard socializing with Rich. We will often do things separate. I'll see friends, he can stay at home and then he'll see friends and I can stay at home. But that's such a shame. I really miss like doing things together with friends and we do. But to be honest, we probably do it more with the kids. Like we'll see friends on a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon and we just all get together. And the older your kids get, the easier that becomes because they can just go upstairs and play and you can actually have a conversation when they're little. You literally can't, you're like in a playground. I actually think playgrounds are the worst place to see friends with kids because then your kids are all over the place and you can't hang out. We tend to just go to someone's house because then the kids can just play and we can chat over a cup of tea. So we tend to socialize during the day, to be honest, but we'll book in every now and again, a night out, a dinner with friends, and it's always so amazing when we do, but we are tired. We've actually booked in for the first time. My mum is having the kids for an afternoon on a Saturday so that we can see our friends who don't have kids and feel like we are, it was like pre-kids where you see people during the day. Sometimes I just don't wanna go out in the evening, I'm tired. So it's it's tricky, but all parents kind of find it tricky and just don't put the pressure on. Find other ways. If you're not wanting to go out with friends, find other ways to like connect with them and catch up. Okay, the next question and the final question is how do you get over the loss of a close friendship? You don't need to go into detail as to why the friendship ended. And to be honest, I've recorded the answer to this question or other similar questions about five times over the last two years and I always delete and decide not to put it in when I'm editing so but almost every other question when I asked for a question on Instagram was are you still friends with Anna and I think for me part of moving forward in life and part of my like healing process. I think I have to acknowledge it. I've tried not to, and I feel like I can't get past the last hurdle. I don't wanna dread every Q and A. <laughs> I don't wanna dread my comments section. Anna and I haven't been close friends for over two years, and I've never been able to speak about it because it's very hard to talk about a situation that doesn't just involve you yourself, that involves two people. My main priority will always be to be a decent human, a respectful, adult. I also was just nervous to bring attention to something which I didn't want more attention on <laughs> but I do think two years down the line I am able to cope with that a lot better. We're both grown-up women. There's no tea spilling. This is not a soap opera. We've seen each other a couple of times since and it's been fine and we've had a nice catch-up. We're just not close friends like how you guys remember us being. Time is the only thing that helps a heart heal. And I know you guys can see what a good place I'm in now. And I don't know what else to say. It's all gonna be okay. I'm sorry it took me so long to acknowledge it. I felt from the beginning a huge amount of guilt and responsibility knowing that you guys were a part of our relationship for so long that I just didn't know how to do that without creating any drama. And I also just didn't feel like I was stable enough. So I hope that you guys can take this information and deal with it respectfully without causing any unwanted drama where there 
isn't. There's no drama. So thank you for sending in all of your questions. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who are lovely, supportive, kind and nice, thank you so much. I will be back again next week with a vlog and I will chat to you guys then. Bye.